A very warm welcome to each of us who are here this afternoon uh, and morning and uh, late evening, depending on which time zone we are here from. We are looking at witnessing a transformational impact with the second chapter of the Global Learning Collaborative for Health Systems Resilience, the Bangladesh chapter. And we'll see what more we do as we get into pursuit with our shared vision as we go forward. The first chapter was launched in March at the Global Collaborative with In Order as the center taking forward the work in putting together a tool for health systems resilience for us to take it across to different regions, different regions and ensure that we understand more about pandemic preventive and healthcare measures at a systemic level and also right down to the last mile. This launch is significant milestone in the journey and growth of the expansion only because we are already in three months getting our second chapter. Serving as this chapter, as a second chapter, it is going to work towards some of the thematic areas that we have already outlined as part of the Global Learning Collaborative in terms of ensuring that we will focus on climate and health amongst some of the other areas that we will take forward as part of the thematic areas. Today, we come together to celebrate Bangladesh's remarkable progress in the healthcare sector. And recently, the book that Professor Mustaq has put together was launched with the 50 year journey that Bangladesh has made towards positive deviations in the global health and understanding what can be done at the last mile to change healthcare for those that do not live in privileged circumstances. Impressive is the masked inoculation, reduced mortality rates, family planning, inoculation, uh, hand hygiene, prevention of diarrhea, telemedicine, and some of the other innovations that have happened during the last few years and more in the pandemic era. Bangladesh's economic strength and wealth of health resources have been crucial drivers of the success leading to remarkable growth and development in the past decades. Notable are the large organizations or the largest nonprofit, BRAC, and their public health efforts, and the Bangladesh Health Watch, who are currently going to be our partners so that they bring in larger partnerships as they go forward into making this understanding and learning journey of pandemic resilience a reality. Today, we honor the resilience and progress of Bangladesh and are honored to be a part of this collaborative journey towards building better health systems. Once again, I welcome all of us on this momentous occasion and look forward to transformative impact of the Global Learning Collaborative and the Bangladesh chapter as we work towards a shared vision and a shared goal to improve the resilience of health systems. My privilege to invite Professor Mushtaq Chaudhary, Raza Chaudhary, a very well-known figure in Bangladesh and in the field of public health. He is the convener currently of Bangladesh Health Watch, advisor, James P. Grant School of Public Health, Brock University, and Professor, Population and Family Health, Columbia University in New York. Mushtaq Bhai is a development worker and has understood things at the grassroots and is a micro philanthropist. He spent about four decades with Brock, the world's largest NGO, as the vice chair, director, founding director and research of evaluation division, now that has been merged with the graduate institutes of Brock University. The founding dean of James B. Grant School of Public Health, currently 
Professor Chowdhury is also a professor of population and family health at Columbia University, New York. Is a senior advisor, has been a senior advisor to the Rockefeller Foundation and a fellow at the Harvard University. Numerous awards of excellence have been endowed on him and bestowed by the, um, the medical award excellence bestowed by Chicago based Ronald McDonald House of Charities 2017 among some of the prominent ones that he has been given. On boards, committee members of several organizations published 20 peer-reviewed scientific articles and of course, author of several books. He holds a PhD from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and a master's from the London School of Economics, a BA honors in statistics from Dhaka University, a son of the soil who has actually shown several paths to Bangladesh in the field of health and public health in particular. I invite Dada to please share his address. Thank you, Uma, for this uh, very elaborate uh, introduction. Uh, uh, so people already have known that, that you are a good friend. Uh, and <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, everybody. Uh, greetings from Bangladesh. Uh, on behalf of Bangladesh Health Watch and uh, the Brack University uh, School of Public Health, I welcome you to the launch of the Bangladesh chapter of the Global Learning Collaborative for Health Systems Resilience, which we call GLC for HSR in short. We thank Access Health International for their brilliant decision to include Bangladesh in their network. Thank you. Uh, the pandemic COVID-19 is almost over, hopefully. It has left with 7 million deaths and nearly 800 million reported cases. It has taught us many things, but the most important learning is that our health systems are really weak to withstand a crisis like COVID-19. Managing a future crisis like COVID-19 will require building a health system that is more resilient, that will be able to maintain its core functions during crisis to protect human life and produce good health outcomes. With support from the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, for which I was fortunate to work for a few years, uh, the Access Health International has initiated the global GLC for HSR, which has just been introduced by UMA. And we in Bangladesh are very happy to join this as a country chapter. Today in this meeting, we'll learn more about the initiative from the director of the initiative, Dr. Krishna Reddy Nalamala. We are also very pleased that uh, uh, Dr. Hussein Zillur Rahman, uh, who is a foremost and, uh, and the most respected development thinkers of Bangladesh, has kindly agreed to deliver the keynote speech. Thank you, Zillur, for this. So with these few words, ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you to the launching of the Bangladesh chapter of the GLC HSR. We look for, forward to working with all of you uh, in taking the GLC agenda forward. Thank you. Can we applaud it? Can we applaud something? Okay. Uh, Dada, it's <laughs> always a privilege to hear you speak. But to set the backdrop and the stage of where this journey began and where we have reached over the last 18 months or so. I would request Dr. Krishna Reddy Nalamala to share that journey. But before he does that, does that, to some of the audience that don't know him, there is a brief bio. A board certified practicing senior cardiologist in President Asia Access Health International, he's also a 
president of InOrder, a health systems training institute set up as an associate of Access Health. Dr. Reddy has co-founded Care Hospitals in 1997, a chain of tertiary care hospitals located in six states across the country, India. He grew the chain from as a CEO from 2006 to 2013 into the no, now recognized advanced and complete cardiac care center in the country and modified all the areas and modeled it for patient satisfaction and innovation. In his illustrious career, he has founded many enterprises with a mission to involve and evolve models of high quality healthcare that is affordable and accessible. He co-founded Relisys Medical Devices in 1998 after realizing the first coronary stent in collaboration with Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam. So it was then that we started the Make in India journey. In order to create the indigenous platforms for medical devices to make them affordable. Dr. Reddy, who where Access Health started in his office is now the international director across Asia and since 2018. And he leads his passion, which is health system strengthening. And he also says, we are doctors of health systems and assumes the role of President Asia this year. Indeed, a privilege, Dr. Eddy, We'd like you to take us through the journey for the Global Learning Collaborative for Health Systems Resilience. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Uma. I think uh, my warm greetings to all of you from the BRAC family, as well as Bangladesh Health Watch and other invitees who have come from Bangladesh. Uh, a lot of GLC members, GLC advisors. Uh, it's my privilege to kind of re-articulate the GLC and most of our, most of you were in this audience. I mean, now you are part of the family of GLC. Uh, I don't have to introduce that, uh, but I briefly try to summarize uh, the founding objective of the GLC and how it is getting organized and how it wants to move ahead uh, to achieve its founding purpose. So the, uh, uh, I think as outlined already, the founding purpose, I think all of us who are in this audience, we are doing in different ways. We are doing, uh, contributing to the health systems transformation or health system strengthening effort or health system resilience effort. Uh, it is another way of contributing to that effort. Uh, but only thing is uh, the COVID has taught us the power of collaboration. I mean, we knew that collaboration works, but COVID has made it amply clear that uh, to face challenge of COVID magnitude, not only COVID, the emerging shocks, whether it is geopolitical conflicts, whether it is climate change, whether it is economic collapse, uh, we are witnessing everything. I mean, we have seen Sri Lanka, uh, how it has witnessed, we have seen Pakistan and many parts of the world uh, reeling under the floods. Uh, we have the geopolitical conflict, uh, which is impacting the whole world. Uh, so indirectly impacting the healthcare as well. So idea was to uh, uh, have nurture a culture of collaborative learning because any system, any organization, any individual, if they have that culture of uh, continuous learning, a ongoing learning, but in a collaborative fashion between the different stakeholders. That culture has that continuous transformative effect on the health systems. That it, so this was the premise on which the GLC was founded, that collaborative learning as a culture across health systems, across different levels, from the local to the global levels, and across 
the different stakeholders, whether it's providers or the payers or the public health professionals or the governance system, uh, public servants, uh, this culture uh, should transform the health system. So that was the, uh, uh, the theory of change or whatever the hypothesis behind the GLC. Uh, some of the guiding principles of organization of the GLC were stated. That means it will be self-organizing. So it will evolve just like any organic system. It will be self-governing. So since it is not any legal entity, it is the governing by all of us. Uh, basically, all the voices can be heard in what direction the learning collaborative can be taken forward. And more importantly, how to make it a perpetual self-sustaining organization. I mean, Rockefeller uh, gave the seed, seed funding. Uh, Access Health continues to support and nurture it as the founding parent. And slowly it, it will evolve into a self-sustaining model so that it is not jeopardized its longevity by depending on a, any a single donor. It has to be a collective donation, not just the financial resources, but the collective donation of the knowledge, the time, the experience, and expertise. We don't value these as donations, but these are equal donations uh, a, a person can contribute to. In addition to those who have money, they contribute money, but these are equally important or more important. Uh, the donation of knowledge, donation of experience, donation of wisdom. Yes. This is what we expect from all the GLC members that mutually we share uh, uh, whatever we know of, uh, whatever insights that we bring from different systems. So in this process, the GLC is getting organized around geographies, whether it is global level, starting with then regional, South Asia, Southeast Asia, East Asia, uh, now West Asia. Uh, so these are the regional uh, uh, kind of a organization. Then we are getting into the national level organization in the form of national chapters. I mean, today we are meeting for that purpose of organizing around, uh, because each level, the context, the problems, the lessons, they're different. There are some common lessons, but there are unique lessons which are relevant to a given context. So this type of organizing around national levels or the subnational, even the state or provincial levels, even going down to a fundamental unit of health system that is at the district level or even the village level. Uh, so this is one level of organization around the geographies. The second, which is the core element of the GLC, that is the learning process, the learning journey. Uh, in fact, in the annual conclave, uh, we have described with analogy of the rivers, rivers traveling to join the ocean as its purpose, as the ultimate purpose of the rivers to join the ocean. And just like the rivers, the rivulets form the rivers and the rivers again feed the farms to fertilize the lands and again join back to join the ocean. So, so it will evolve around the themes and the sub-themes and the sub-sub-themes and the join back. I mean, this is the process of learning journey on a perpetual basis so that uh, it becomes a, a kind of a long... So we are trying to organize these learning themes based on the feedback from the advisors, based on the feedback from the members around certain themes which are relevant and which are of priority nature to a given context. But to begin with, the commencing theme was to first define the health system resilience, then try to understand the core functions of health systems and the cross-linking functions. And most importantly, I think any given at a country level or a, a state level or a provincial level or a district level, the starting point of the transformation is the assessment of that system. Vis-a-vis -vis its normal function, its security function, and its resilience characteristic. So that is what I, in the last one year, in fact, the GLC with all the participation, including members as well as external experts has reached a stage where uh, we, we have a kind of a framework 
uh, indicators which reflect the resilience and the tool to validate in a given context, whether it is in Bangladesh. Uh, in fact, that will be the starting point at a country level because that crystallizes where the health system in each country is, what are the gaps and what we need to do to strengthen it, what we need to do to make it more secure and what, how we to prepare each system to absorb in case we are unable to prevent future health shocks. So, and then those learnings should be translated into actions, whether it is policies or strategies or operational plans. So this cycle of learning to action and action to learning, I mean, that was articulated uh, uh, in the annual conclave as well. So this is in brief uh, the, uh, the journey so far and what it is looking at the future. Uh, so every country will bring out a lot of insights which are actionable within that country, as well as insights which can be copied by others with a similar context. So that whole uh, journey of learning, uh, we hope, I mean, we are not measuring the impact because health systems are so complex and so many actors are there in the health systems. Each one has something to contribute. And just to measure an impact is actually foolish. I mean, the journey is more, more important. I think equally more important with the hope that if we do the journey well, and if we bring out the insights and some of those insights, if we decide to translate into actions, the transformation has to happen. Uh, it will happen. So that is the, the contents of this journey that we, but we also should monitor how it is transforming and how much we are contributing to this collaborative effort of multiple people in multiple ways they're acting in this direction. So I think with this beef uh, 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 on the GLC and what is the future that the GLC is looking towards, uh, I'm most excited. Actually, uh, I visited Dhaka recently as a part of the WHO Sierra PSC forum. Uh, yeah, the networks are widening. In fact, uh, the GLC, uh, whether it is uh, partnering with Pandemic Action Network, so it, it amplifies the learning process. If it is partnering with the WHO CRO PSC Forum, it amplifies the focus of learning around the PSC. If it is partnering with CHISTI, uh, the National Convener of Indonesia, and also the founder member of the PSC Forum in the non-governmental space, again, it amplifies that. So. Uh, this is the amplification. I mean, uh, through a partnership with other networks and other collaboratives. Uh, ultimately, if uh, we can achieve that global networking of partners and the members and uh, the governing agencies, both the global UN agencies as well as the national agencies, I think we have achieved the objective and we hope to achieve it. And I think we are content with all the stalwarts who are already in this forum itself. Uh, they are world thought leaders. Some of you are respected worldwide for your thoughts. So I think, uh, and there is a humbleness to continue to learn from the ground, actually. So that, that humbleness and that eagerness to continue to learn by your presence, I think uh, that gives a huge hope to the GLC that we will achieve the purpose. So with these remarks, I again, a warm welcome on behalf of Access Health, as well as as a secretariat of the GLC. Uh, I, I pause here and over to you, Ma, uh, for taking it forward. Thank you, Dr. Reddy and uh, Professor Chaudhary. It is on behalf of all of us that with great pride that I invite this afternoon, Professor Dr. Hussain Zalur Rahman. Our keynote uh, speaker for this afternoon. To introduce him is a great pride for me because, as the chairperson and governing body of BRAC, a member advisory group of the Bangladesh Health Watch, Dr. Rahman leads the policy voice of Bangladesh with his wide ranging experience within and outside of the government. A master's degree in economics from Dhaka University, a PhD in political sociology from Manchester University, Dr. Rahman founded the Dhaka-based think tank Power and Participation Research Center, PPRC for short, 
in 1996 and was elected the chairperson of Brak Bangladesh in 2019. He led internationally several initiatives, a 62 village analysis of the poverty trends project at the Bangladesh Institute of Development and Studies, 1989 to 1998, what a water length, and was the lead consultant in drafting the government of Bangladesh's poverty reduction strategy in 2004. He is an appointed member of the Independent South Asian Commission on Poverty Alleviation between 2003 and 6, and also served on the board of the Central Bank of Bangladesh. Dr. Rahman authors influential works such as Rethinking Rural Poverty, SAGE in 1995, Local Governance and Community Capacities, UPL in 2002, Governance and State Effectiveness in Asia in 2006, Unbundling of Governance, PPRC 2007, and uh, that list is quite exhaustive. Exploring a more effective and pro-poor targeting approach, the PPRC USAID Collaborative in 2018, Dr. Rahman was a key contributor to the adoption of the National Social Security Strategy and remains an active policy researcher on issues of sustainable urbanization, social protection, health, inclusive growth, quality education, governance, wash, road safety, and population policies. Dr. Rahman served as the advisor, cabinet minister. The logical conclusion where policy where rubber meets the road for the ministries of education and commerce in the caretaker government of Bangladesh between 2007 and 8 and was credited with a lead role in the subsequent return Bangladesh to electoral democracy. He was awarded the John Muir Global Citizenship Award by the Institute for Global Leadership Tufts University in 2001. Dr. Rahman is one of the three awardees of the Gold Medal Award 2013 of the Rotary International Bangladesh for his services to humanity. It is indeed a privilege to lead even such an illustrious career and such an impactful voice that we will have this afternoon as we share his thoughts as a keynote speaker at our Bangladesh launch. Uh, I request you to bring up the slides for uh, Professor Rahman, and uh, I request Dr. Rahman to take the next and share his address with us. Thank you so much, Uma Aisola, uh, for a very generous introduction. I was a bit embarrassed actually by the details. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I also want to record uh, my appreciation of my friend Mushtaq Choudhury, who actually really interested me to get engaged on health issues uh, when he was at Rockefeller. And uh, I've been extremely thankful that he did engage me because I've now come to realize why economists also must embrace health as a key priority for their own discipline. Uh, so uh, I also should note that uh, when Access Health International was launching the GLC, uh, they had uh, reached out to me and I had actually possibly joined the introductory meeting. And I'm extremely happy to see the journey that uh, Krishna Rita Nalamala mentioned. And now I'm so happy to see that a Bangladesh chapter led by my illustrious friend Mushtaq is now taking place. And I think therefore the, the, this intent to collaborate is an important resource for today's world. Because I think 
the problems are global and only through shared learning and collaboration, we can deal with both the global problems and our own individual problems too. So I am extremely happy, as I said, and uh, uh, also congratulations to Access Health International for really driving this process forward. I'm, I could also, as an anecdote, I remember inviting a member of your uh, August body to the, I think that was the first uh, universal health coverage conference, international conference in Dhaka in 2015 that PPRC organized and uh, someone, uh, Onuradha Katyal, I think joined that. So having said that, uh, let me quickly switch back to today's event, uh, the launch of the Bangladesh chapter and a very brief overview of where Bangladesh stands and how we stand to both contribute and uh, in a way learn from this, uh, this exercise. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, it's a very short presentation I thought I would prepare. So if we could move to the next slide. That's the opening, yeah. Okay, uh, no, before that, I think there is some, yeah. So just a quick, map of Bangladesh, I mean, uh, locating health within the larger journey that Bangladesh has made in the last 50 years. So I, I've, you know, this is a heroic uh, sort of summarizing and obviously many things will have been omitted, but uh, just in terms of, I would like to note six transformational achievements that Bangladesh really uh, did within this 50 years. First was in 1970, you know, we had this massive Bola cyclone. Lacks of people died. And since for a long time, Bangladesh imagery was defined by a disaster victim. 50 years down the line, globally now we are recognized as a disaster manager. And a lot of things to offer to the global audience in that. So, Disaster victim to disaster manager. That's one of the transformational achievements that Bangladesh did. And in that, health was also one of the key focus. The second is the population management. You know, Bangladesh, very small landmass, a lot of people, but the fertility decline, uh, managing the fertility decline has been a great achievement. And the, the strategy of managing this itself was as great as the uh, uh, the outcome itself because it was a social campaign approach communication played a great role and also the you know the supply chains of products was also a very important achievement that was done so population management again a great transformation uh, achievement in the 50 years the third you know 100 now it's 170 million people it was 70 million when we started in 1970. Bangladesh was food deficit when we are 70 million. We are nearly food self-sufficient when we are now 170 million. So Bangladesh agriculture and on the food security frontier, we have done a commendable job, I would say. And that has allowed us to really focus on the social issues, education, health, Otherwise, we'd all be concerned with that first basic need of food. The third is that, you know, countries like ours, in particular in South Asia, it may be one country, but actually it may, in reality, it may be many worlds within one country. You know, metropolitan centers might be part of the first world, and then we have a lot of third worlds also across. One of the achievements of Bangladesh in the last 50 years is the rural urban connectivity, which has really transformed. Remoteness is no longer a major problem for Bangladesh. There is still challenges, of course, in pockets, but overall, we now have an integrated national economy. And from sunset to sun, uh, sunrise to sunset, if you have a car, you can almost reach any part of Bangladesh. Uh, that's a massive achievement to deliver services, to deliver messages, and to establish people-to-people -people relationship. Fifth transformational achievement is that we're also not a backwater of the global economy. 
we are very much integrated into the global economy and our i'm not going to go into the details of our economic achievements etc but just to say that we are very much uh, integrated in the global economy through our exports through our human capital export etc and uh, in that sense is not isolated economy that we're talking about lastly women have emerged as extremely uh, important and credible socioeconomic actors so six transformation achievements just to understand where we are there was what drove this achievement uh, I'm just summarizing it. Five drivers of change, in my view. First, what I call a personality revolution, because at the end of the day, we can have these collaboratives, we can have institutions, but the individual citizen also need to be proactive in terms of you know, generating their demand, responding to opportunities when they come, also doing their own bit in terms of transforming micro realities. Bangladesh has, in that sense, undergone a personality revolution I would, that's how i characterize it that a population steeped in fatalism has now become aspiration and that's a massive sociological journey which has been achieved over the 50 years second driver of change is that we haven't only relied on say, governments or policy driven transformation there has been an extremely strong grassroots culture of solution-centric innovations. You know, non-government actors like BRAC, Ramin, Ganushastu Kendro, and others have played an important role. Government also has played an uh, important role, but there has been a very strong culture of solution-centric innovations. Uh, that's uh, very important. At the same time, our uh, you know, the development discourse also has been reality grounded. I just take the example of social protection. You know, how over time, how we manage to identify new clientele for these sort of programs, how to deliver these to new places. And it has been an important development discourse. You know, urban was not a focus before say 2005 or so. Urban has now become a very important focus. This has been driven by a development discourse, which is very strongly connected to reality grounded research etc fourth driver of change also is important which is that you know systems need accountability and in bangladesh uh, accountability through contested politics was an important driver of change and lastly i should also mention this policy entrepreneurship i mean you can have policies you can have government you know i was a minister myself and i saw how it is not enough that there is a department they have to be uh, important persons in those departments who are actually proactive, who are trying to connect with other actors in the non-government space and together trying to bring about change. This policy entrepreneurship, in my sense, in South Asia in particular, is an important focus that hopefully new books will be written uh, down the line. The next slide, please. Please alert me if I'm taking too much of time, I'll cut short immediately. Thank you. That was the bigger development story. What about the health balance sheet? Bring to focus in what we are interested in. Let me start with the positives. We have a pluralistic healthcare. I mean, this is important. There's the government sector. There is also the very much the private sector, which itself, there is the commercial end of it. But there is also like a social end of the private sector, you know, uh, Ganoshasto Kendro or National uh, Heart Foundation, Bragg's own work. These are not totally driven by only commercial ideas, though they are in the non outside of the government sector. So we have a pluralistic healthcare. That's a very important uh, achievement. We have, you know, one of our key focus. You know, health system is a very wide space. One of our key focus was to identify initially where did people really, you know, where did the big deaths occur? You know, natural disasters is a big phenomenon in Bangladesh. Say if 10,000 people died in a disaster, 50,000 people would die in the post-disaster epidemic. One of the key positive of the health system 
has been that the post disaster epidemic and deaths have been almost reduced to a very small numbers actually this is a very important achievement and that has been done through social campaign approach a strong focus on a, a communication strategy to how to uh, deal you know anti diarrheal uh, uh, medicines available etc so this is a, again a very important achievement one of the positives on the balance sheet from 19 we had a uh, drug policy in 1982 and one of its important transformational consequences was was to catalyze the emergence of a domestic pharmaceutical industry so now it is if you even if you go into a remote village you will find a you know what's like a grocery shop we call it mudir dukan i don't know what you call it in india like they were a roadside shop and among many things you will find that they will have some basic medicine in store so this is also a great uh, not just the industry itself but it has made medicine available across the country even to the remote areas and sustainable supply chains as uh, uh, likewise a comfort this is an and now we are also exporting medicines quality medicines actually into many countries including us which is a uh, uh, which, which tells you some fourth positive i would say is a steady stream of technical and process innovation despite all you know the orceline has you know has been mentioned in many, many places but there are also many process innovations which have been accumulating over the years i don't want to go into too much details new potentialities have emerged for example midwifery has come on board as an important focus not the traditional midwife but midwifery as a trained profession has really now come and brack uh, i should credit uh, the late visionary founder of brack uh, sir fazl hasan apel for really taking initiative to open a a uh, segment in in the brack university on this midwifery and now there are many other uh, option that's a important achievement that i would say will play a role in bringing down maternal mortality rates community clinics you know in the doorstep of the rural areas is also an important innovation with potentiality lot of gaps etc but lot of uh, potentiality to telemedicine post covid telemedicine actually also has emerged as an important choice for uh, service seekers and also there are providers who are coming for and many other potential areas may also be emerged we have also some awareness success distinct awareness success for example disability has become an important policy focus in the government and in the non government sector and that has led to some important laws being uh, passed etc etc that's something to be noted also and during covid covid vaccination was a definite success that bangladesh initially hesitant but later on we really established a well uh, using technology a very good system whereby vaccination rates uh, were well achieved but obviously uh, the reason we are talking on health system resilience today is that there are despite these achievements obviously there are gaps and challenges and let me just quickly run through them low utilization of public health infrastructure this you know we have the pluralistic care but this low utilization itself is and for example uh, there are both compete competition from the private sector but also process problems for example the public health infrastructure closes after in the uh, after lunch so it's not really available for the other hours so there are multiple issues there one can look at but this is one of the key gaps that we have uh, we identify highly unfavorable skill mix you know nurse to doctor ratio and allied profession ratio there is a it's not the ideal mix the recommended mix is the uh, rather the other way around there is still some stigma burden on allied professions is gradually is being overcome for example nursing still now suffer from that uh and therefore talented people coming into this profession there are some barriers but this is i'm happy to see that some changes are occurring here 
problem of rural retention, it may be a similar problem in India. We have in the public health infrastructure in particular, uh, the retaining doctors is a huge issue. Very critical issue is the high and rising out-of-pocket expense burden. You know, in 2012, government uh, initiated a strategy to bring down this, but uh, over the next 10 years, it has gone the other direction. This is a, uh, the affordability issue becomes then a big problem and access then is affected. There are, of course, you know, these are common problem in many countries, misgovernance and corruption is are important issues because the, what they do is that they, uh, in a way, subtract resources from where it should really be deployed. I wanted to also mention this, the rising burden of accidents and lack of emergency care. You know, as we urbanize, uh, and Bangladesh is urbanizing very fast, the burden of accidents, road crashes are rising exponentially, actually, and the lack of emergency care is going to be a future problem. There is also some, you know, you're talking of health system. So there is problems of jurisdictional ambiguity, for example, between Ministry of Health and Ministry of Local Government. And that has really stymied the robust progress on urban, prim urban primary health care. We have a uh, urban primary health care is one of the weak spots in the overall health system. Private sector is a strong part of our you know, health sector reality, but there are also misincentives. And I should mention this irrational rising in cesarean births. You know, the latest data is showing that it's now as high as 44%, where the global norm is 15%. It's a cause for concern. I should also mention that there is also this problem of over bureaucratization of health sector leadership. This is an issue, I think important issue, because then the solutions, even if they're there, whether the policymakers will take them on board remains to be seen. So this is just like in way of a balance sheet. Quickly, I think I just have two more uh, slides. Next one. Uh, okay, so I just, again, maybe it's already come, but I just wanted to, uh, again, inform why myself as an economist now have become a very great enthusiast for the health uh, discussion, because I'm seeing that the, there are four meta, meta, global meta trends, which are transforming health from a sectoral to a strategic agenda. One is, of course, climate change and health risks. And as you know, the, uh, uh, that has been discussed and uh, will be discussed more. Unplanned urbanization uh, is creating a crisis of air and water pollution, road accidents, et cetera. This is also a matter trend. Modern lifestyle, you know, and, and cities is now the major challenge. And that's because of the lifestyle issues and the financial risk of healthcare uh, become an entrance source of economic shock for the poor and middle classes. And myself being a poverty uh, researcher, I can see how uh, that is an important concern, economic concern that we have to take on board. Uh, next one, hopefully this is. So crisis and health system resilience. I think it's so important that you are taking on board this issue of health system resilience. It's very, very timely. And COVID I think has underscored the importance of this more than ever. I think the four point that you have highlighted prevent, prevent, prepare, respond, learn, rightly, uh, I think, targeted. Bangladesh, taking the example of Bangladesh, Bangladesh has done good on vaccination, but health system weaknesses were exposed in preparedness and response to the COVID-19 related health services, as well as there was collateral damage in contraction of non-COVID health services. That's also an important issue. And as we speak now, there's a new crisis sweeping Bangladesh. This is the dengue crisis. And this is not the usual seasonal problem. That is very clear that this is also linked to climate impact. Vulnerable in the changing rain patterns and heat waves are creating new type of public health emergencies. And therefore, I think uh, the important question of health sector resilience has come to the fore. And I think what is your mission in a way is to learn from the previous experiences for better preparedness for future. So I think that's right on the right track. I would just appeal also here that when you talk, think of health system, it should encompass both healthcare and public health because they are so integrally linked. 
often I see talking to medical professionals, the important link and the importance of public health itself is sometimes not appreciated enough. And the final slide is uh, shared learning is a global priority. Is I think it's a, we have to put it at that level. It's a global priority. And I think this global learning collaborative for health system resilience, GLC for HSR is a very timely initiative in these challenging times for cross country as well as cross region learning. And I'm so happy that Bangladesh is a part of this initiative as I think I believe uh, we have much to gain from this shared learning, but Bangladesh has also much to offer to the collective in terms of uh, from drawing from its multifaceted experience. And I'm very happy that Bangladesh Health Watch has been identified as the right platform to host it. My friend Mushtaq is a, a D, I think a, the critical health, non-government health sector leader here. And they have a very strong track record in engaging with various stakeholders, including civil society, donor, media, and the government. And I, on my own behalf, I'm happy to commit to work with Bangladesh Health Watch. On, uh, Mushtaq was kind enough to include me on the advisory board. I'll be happy to commit to work. And I wish this initiative all success in its forward journey. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Rehman. Shared learning is a global priority. And I don't think that that can be emphasized more than how you put it across. And the balance sheet approach that you took to share this journey is something that will remain in our thoughts for a long time. It's very easy to look at financial ba balance sheets, but when you have to look at a health balance sheet and a health systems balance sheet, it is yet another way of looking at economics and how you have integrated health and economics together. At this point, before we move further, I request everybody to get on camera, please, for us to take the customary photograph that we like to have as each of our sessions and this one more special because it is the launch of our chapter. As many as we can, please, that can be on camera. Half a minute more. Stuti, can I switch back? Taken. Couple of people more that need to come in. Thank you very much. Dr. Eman, I have also the privilege of bringing on camera Shrikant and Anuradha. Anuradha, who traveled to meet you in 2015. Anuradha, can you come up front and show yourself? So it is again a historical movement. Hi, Anuradha. You're on mute, Anuradha. Hello, sir. Thank you. Great to see you again. Thank you so much. I have the privilege now to take on the next part of the uh, journey that we are on this afternoon. And to introduce Professor Male Kanti Mruda, who is the Professor and Deputy Dean, Dean Director, Center, for Non-Communicable Diseases and Nutrition, Brock James P. Grant School of Public Health, Brock University. Dr. Malekanti Riza is a professor at the Brock James P. School, and he is internationally recognized for his science in the field of public health and nutrition. He has the unique combination of expertise in medicine and public health. 
epidemiology, non-communicable diseases, public health nutrition, public health research programs, training, teaching, academic supervision, and leading a research center of excellence for non-communicable diseases and nutritional research. He's co-authored and published more than 134 original research articles and reports. He receives grants from unilateral and bilateral agencies, including the USAID, Food for Agriculture Organization, WHO, Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, UN Children's Fund, amongst others, the Wellcome Trust, and the Government of Bangladesh, Japan's International Cooperation Agencies, amongst others, the founding director of the Research for Center of Excellence for Communicable Diseases and Nutrition. He's currently in charge of implementing comprehensive research agenda to control and prevent non-communicable diseases and malnourishment in Bangladesh and the Global South. Professor Molloy, I hand it over to you to give us the special address on the resilient measurement tool for this afternoon. Anuradha, I request you to be on standby for support. Um, sure. Professor Malloy, if you are talking, we can't hear you. Dada, you are mute. You are mute. Please unmute your... Yeah, so... Okay. So can you see the screen? All good, Professor. Okay. So um, thank you very much. I'm very delighted to, uh, to know about the launch of this Global Learning Collaborative for Health System Resilience. And uh, I'm also very glad uh, to present some slides on the Health System Resilience, resilience Framework uh, that is developed by the Global Learning Collaborative for Health System Resilience. So in this presentation, like I think I have 10 minutes time, I would like to take you through uh, some of the background of health systems resilience, and also like how this framework has been developed and uh, the indicators in this framework and uh, what we do want to do in Bangladesh. Um, and glad to know that this framework will be tested uh, in Bangladesh uh, for health system resilience, resilience assessment. Uh, so, I mean, uh, Professor Jalil Rahman, uh, Mushtagubai, uh, and others already talked about the importance of health system resilience. Uh, and this is uh, not a new agenda, but like this is, this is a re-emerging agenda. And um, so one of the things we can talk about that like uh, there was renewed interest on health system resilience uh, during the West Africa Ebola epidemic. And at that time, uh, people all over the globe understood the concept that the health is a global concept and uh, and also like uh, the legal and policy foundations to guide response and ensure accountability is lacking. And also uh, there is a need for a strong dedicated health workforce all over the world. And during that time, we also understood that um, there is a need for strengthening genomic surveillance. There is a need for developing framework related uh, to disaster recovery and uh, resilience. And at the same time, uh, digital transformation in healthcare is also needed. And then came COVID. And uh, Professor Jill Raman also told us that uh, during the COVID, uh, there was uh, another uh, renewed interest on health system resilience and people got to learn 
a lot of things uh, during the COVID, we were unprepared, our health system got overburdened. And also we found that like we have an, an alarming gap in infectious disease surveillance uh, and we didn't know how to prepare ourselves. But at the same time, the positive, um, on a positive note, we can say that like COVID-19 pandemic was a transformational catalyst. And that's why like uh, we could understood what is needed, how we can better prepare ourselves uh, in the face of uh, a health crisis. And at the same time, we also understood that there is a need for creating uh, a framework to measure health resilience. And, and also like strength and collaboration, international collaboration is required. And that is what we also understood from COVID. And, and amazingly, we could, for example, develop a vaccine within one year of time so this is remarkable achievement for human history, but it could have not been done without uh, this strong international collaboration. So that's why um, the journey of collaborative learning center um, uh, started, I mean, and it uh, took the initiative to uh, understand health system resilience in a better way. And that's why it tried to develop a framework but that journey started with uh, reviewing of existing framework. Like you see here, there are uh, six framework that have been uh, reviewed. So one, one framework, I mean, two frameworks at the macro level, disaster mitigation framework, and also UN disaster risk reduction framework. And then also at meso level, like uh, which can be implemented in the country, like in the country's resilience framework and health system framework of the WHO, you all know about that framework. So those have been reviewed. And at the micro level checklist for improving health system resilience and also city resilience framework, uh, those are already available, have also been reviewed. But during the review process, a uh, gap analysis was done. And also like uh, the six building blocks of health systems were used and this, uh, the information was put into or categorized into a six by four matrix. And that matrix included the four uh, phases of disaster risk reduction. And then uh, GLC uh, for ACSR also wrote a scoping paper, interviewed academicians and practitioners and also all these things were, were taken to a peer-to-peer -peer learning session. And that's how the process uh, culminated and the framework was developed and indicators um, to measure have been mapped. So, uh, and it also uh, reiterated the characteristics for uh, understanding a resilient health system, and which are built around the six building blocks of the WHO health system. But as you see here, uh, during the gap analysis, uh, and also uh, we found that like the attributes of uh, a resilient health system should be uh, in the area of health workforce, in the area of management information system, health financing, uh, service delivery and medical supplies and equipment. Uh, so we want to make sure that our resilient health system must have adequate trained and willing workforce. It should have uh, a plan for sustaining uh, routine healthcare delivery even during the health crisis. And it should have uh, information communication channel, health financing mechanism, governance, leadership, and accountability framework, and also like uh, medical supplies and equipment. But that's not the end of it. Uh, during this exercise, uh, I mean, GLC for ACES are also uh, found that like there are certain elements in the health system uh, that makes health system resilient uh, has got a low representation. 
It means that like uh, in the health system resilient framework currently, and also like uh, when we talk about health system, we don't, don't talk about like how lives are being saved through health system, how a health system takes initiative to reduce long-term vulnerability, how uh, it protects and uh, secure health workforce. And also like uh, the culture is taken in account, the genetic surveillance is also taken in account. So those things are uh, not in the discussion of a resilient health system or it has got less representation. And that's how, uh, I mean, uh, GLC for ACSR developed a new definition of a resilient health system that deals with access to high quality and affordable healthcare and uh, a resilient health system can safeguard and guarantee uh, this uh, quality and affordable healthcare irrespective of any shock uh, from man-made disaster or natural disaster. And in terms of the six frameworks uh, that were reviewed uh, during this exercise, uh, so uh, we found that uh, governance and leadership were mentioned in all these six uh, frameworks, but medical and supplies and equipment uh, are missing in two frameworks health financing and workforce uh, is missing in three frameworks, four frameworks miss, misses uh, miss like the information system monitoring and surveillance system and uh, cross sector collaboration is missed in one framework, but the need for resource for making health system resilient uh, has been missed from all the reviewed frameworks. So therefore it creates an opportunity for a new framework and also uh, we understand and hope that this new framework and the data generated from this new framework can help us to learn more about the communities and countries, how uh, health system resilient, how resilient the health systems in these communities and countries are, and how we can strengthen our learning regarding what work and what do not work, and also how can we prepared ourselves better and focused ourselves to be resilient uh, uh, in future shock, uh, in the face of future shock, and how can we can make a better collaboration, like multi-plong collaboration and multi-stakeholder effort uh, in uh, reality, so that like uh, health systems can be more resilient. So that's why these three. Things have already been done, like expert reviewers, uh, reviews, practitioners' views, and addressing comments. But now we want to implement this uh, framework and measure country level health system resilience by using the framework and uh, related indicators uh, of these frameworks. And the indicators uh, domains are in four areas leadership and governance, supplies, healthcare provisioning, and financial mobilization. And under leadership and governance domain, there are indicators pertinent to international regulations, collaborations, accountability, convergence, communication, information and relations. Under the supply domain, there are indicators in the area of capacity strengthening, tax shifting, resource allocation and utilization, resource mapping and availability, research and development. And for healthcare provisioning domain, we have indicators in the area of adoption and uh, implementation of policies, demand supply gap, data collection and processing, health literacy and social behavior change communication, and financial mobilization demands and entail uh, mobilization, pooling of resources, priority setting, strategic purchasing, and also financial protection and universal healthcare. So these are the, uh, I mean, indicator domains under the four broad domains of uh, health system resilience um, that have been incorporated in the framework. And we want to use this framework and these indicators now for Bangladesh to assess health system resilience in our country. And thanks uh, uh, Global Health, Global Learning Collaborative 
collaborative uh, for giving us the opportunity to test this uh, framework in Bangladesh context. But uh, we, at the same time, like in this framework, we also have information about information communication and relations. And what Professor Jillu mentioned that like uh, this, I mean, these indicators will also help us to better understand people's health like from the demand and supply gap. So um, I would like to thank uh, Access Health Research Team and also uh, the probable implementation team for this exercise in Bangladesh. Uh, and the team will be formed from uh, members from Bangladesh Health Watch and also Black Sims Prevent School of Public Health. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Malloy. Uh, it's always a pleasure to listen to the validation of the work that we have done in terms of bringing out this tool. And we look forward that we should collaborate together to see how we can make these tools a bottoms up approach, which the collaborative has always looked at rather than a top down approach. Uh, grateful for the time spent. I now have the privilege of introducing Yasmin Appa, Dr. Yasmin H. Ahmed, Advisor, Bangladesh Health Watch. Dr. Yasmin Ahmed, an independent consultant who has served for more than 30 years in the public health area, especially in reproductive health. During the years that she has worked in research and led the government, led the development and expansion of the national NGO as the vice president of an international NGO led the growth and development of 16 country programs in Asia and Asia Pacific. Her work as a consultant has involved strategic planning, project development, project programs, evaluation in the public and non-governmental sectors. Dr. Yasmin Ahmed will take us through an overview of the Bangladesh Health Watch which is going to be one of our integral partners in this chapter. Over to you, Dr. Yasmin. Thank you so much, Uma, and thank you for thoroughly embarrassing me. <laughs> Hello and good afternoon to everyone. Um, if I may say so, on behalf of Bangladesh Health Watch, our entire team, we are so privileged and honored uh, to be a part of this uh, great collaborative uh, approach. And we really look forward uh, to give our best uh, to promote uh, and share uh, learning across the regions uh, in future. So this launch, like uh, Dr. Zilu Rahman says, comes at a quite pertinent time. We have just um, kind of starting to recover from COVID and there is another uh, challenge facing us, uh, that of dengue. And we again wonder that uh, how come we didn't learn, how come we didn't prepare and how come we seem to be suddenly faced with an emergency which had always been there and we knew about it. So uh, we do think uh, that uh, the global learning co collaboration will, uh, you know, in the next uh, two to three years, uh, bring us to a point where uh, such events will no longer be a big surprise and we'll be better prepared. But talking about Bangladesh Health Watch, um, our journey started uh, in 2006 when about a dozen of experts, professionals, specialists in the health sector decided to come together uh, in a civil society platform um, and to form a kind of a watchdog uh, for the health sector. And um, the first part of uh, small seed funding came from Rockefeller, our common friend. And with that, uh, Bangladesh Health Watch published its first uh, report on equity in health sector, which was very well received. It was a well-researched document and received a lot of appreciation. Since then, for the next uh, 12 years, Health Watch uh, continued to publish reports on a topic of interest every other year. And uh, you know, the topics were uh, covered things um, like health workforce, urban health, things which were important at that point of time. 
But as we went through our journey, we realized that just publishing, uh, you know, such reports, no matter how uh, useful they were um, to some sectors, it, it wasn't just enough to bring about changes. So um, we started thinking about how we can engage in more active advocacy so that we can see real change in the way health system works in the country. And uh, that's when we started a project to increase the responsiveness uh, of our health system. So this project, which we started in early 2020, um, right when COVID hit um, and it slowed, down, um, slowed us down a little bit. So um, what we did under this project was to have a, a kind of central structure uh, through which we were trying to do national advocacy, but then have arms around eight quite hard to reach and remote regions uh, of the country and trying to bring about changes locally there. And this has been a very uh, kind of interesting, innovative approach. So in these eight uh, hard to reach areas, we have community groups who have come together um, and with some support and training, uh, they have found ways in which to make small differences uh, in the way health uh, services are delivered in their locality. So installing a tube well somewhere, finding a solar panel and putting it up on the uh, community clinic roof or uh, restricting the visits um, of the medical representatives uh, during all hours of the day. So they have started to make those small changes. And then there are bigger issues which they cannot deal with, absenteeism, for example. Um, so those bigger issues, then they escalate upwards to the center. And in the center, we have um, a very active, but very small uh, secretariat. And that secretariat find ways and means to actually push these issues up to the national level. Um, one of our innovations has been uh, bringing in and including a lot of sector experts uh, into our work without actually um, engaging them in our formal structure. So we have constituted a number of thematic groups, and these thematic groups actually are com composed of professionals uh, from various disciplines. For example, we have a thematic group on health policy and law, which has barristers, which has NGOs uh, working to provide legal aid uh, to the vulnerable. There's another thematic group, which we had formed during COVID times, uh, which con consisted of experts in communicable diseases and epidemics, um, and also health uh, sector managers. So in this way, we try to actually get the best out of those who know the most in that particular field and uh, build up a partnership. And that partnership has helped to actually uh, not just make a better impact than we could have made on our own, but also help to raise the profile of Health Watch. We went into, um, you know, in this active mode for only uh, three years. But already in those three years, I think we have created quite a few ripples and um, we are now recognized by most uh, people in the health sector uh, for the work we do. Uh, one important learning for us has been um, that it is not easy to get yourself heard, especially heard by the government and uh, civic space to certain extent at least, um, has become a bit limited these days. But we have found one important uh, partner and friend in the media community with whom we work both uh, at the local level in those uh, eight remote areas, as well as also in Dhaka. And what, when we say something which doesn't hold ground, we try to get the media to say that, <laughs> And we see that makes a difference and, and people do hear that kind of thing. So if you ask us about our strength, one of our biggest strengths is uh, being able to form partnership and uh, you know, nurture those and use those for um, 
whatever purpose uh, that is needed. Um, besides, uh, we have uh, just as uh, Mushtaq Bhai had mentioned, uh, published a book on uh, which documents what has happened to our health sector, our successes and challenges over the last 50 years. This was a Herculean effort with more than 100 people contributing uh, to the book. And you can imagine the logistics challenges of that. Uh, during COVID time, um, the, we did a lot of work around uh, raising awareness, discussion, and debate on issues which were pertinent at that point. And one of the crucial works was starting the discussion around the quality of PPE, because uh, during the initial phase of the pandemic, uh, the supplies that uh, we were getting for uh, our healthcare were of for our healthcare workers uh, were not of the best quality. So we take um, uh, credit for actually uh, bringing up uh, that issue. And um, we also have uh, quite uh, an interesting website. If you have the time to visit, Masood, uh, linked website. You will find- It is just ticket by the- Acha. <laughs> So maybe what we can do is uh, send you our link um, sometimes uh, quite soon, uh, today or tomorrow. And uh, among uh, the other achievements we have is um, a COVID repository. So uh, during the COVID times, we had found that people were looking for uh, information here, there, everywhere, but not really finding it in one place. So we started putting all the literature that we had peer from peer-reviewed journals on COVID and Bangladesh into, um, into a site in our website. And we are doing the same now for um, equity and for governance. So um, I will stop there. And um, I think on behalf of BHW, we'd like to say that uh, we hope to be an active partner uh, in this collaboration. And, uh, you know, once it gets going, we'll do our best to make sure that things happen and we can look forward to positive change. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Yasmin Appa. I'd like to say that I saw some of that work in action when I was there in Bangladesh recently. It's amazing how they actually influence the voice of the people and ensure that that voice actually reaches where it needs to, both the communications at the bottom of the pyramid and how that is turning into policy and advocacy as they move into the next phase and the next realm of the healthcare, uh, health system strengthening in Bangladesh. I have the privilege of saying we have only five minutes left and asking if I can overshoot by five minutes so that I give the audience a chance to put forward their voices, their comments, their questions and answers. May I have at least two or three of you come forward for us to be able to take this. Any hands that go up? Yeah, Dr. this is... This is uh, Dr. Aftab, as you know. Uh, this was a great learning experience and started. we started already the collaborative learning. So thanks goes to these uh, organizers, all concerned. And on, on behalf of my organization, the Public Health Foundation of Bangladesh, uh, we would like to extend our cooperation and collaboration in this regard in future. Thank you. Looking forward to making you a member uh, uh, and a part of the thematic journeys that we you are you will be interested in. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. May I unmute uh, yourself, uh, Bidan Chandrapalji, and take forward your yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, this is Bidan Chandrapal, founder and managing director of Prabhavara, and we are the Bangladeshi national operator of the world's largest environmental education organization named. Foundation for Environmental Education. And uh, Prabhu Arora, we are leading Bangladesh in many global platforms. Uh, many of its platform are also active at the regional level, such as Consortium for Climate and Health, Global Climate and Health Alliance, 
waste surveillance and so on. I think there is a provision to undertake joint activities in all these areas so that we can work from the climate and environment angle in addition to health. And the way Jilur sir has uh, done his presentation is from a holistic approach and he uh, portrays hope as well as disappear. So thank you very much, sir. Uh, many uh, like me are surely enriched and I may have missed out of, uh, out of, uh, out on his uh, discussion, but there are two things I would like to emphasize. One is that the number of health of the aging population is an important issue. And another point is in today's appeal, better preparedness for the future, it seems that uh, it will be important to focus on how we engage dream and prepare the youth for the future. So uh, GLC for HSR, Bangladesh Country Chapter launch comes at a time when it is a very urgent and timely initiative, but uh, we think that uh, more is needed to work on health alone. We have to work on the environment, climate change and health in an integrated approach. And uh, we want to be connected and contribute to this network. I feel honored to be here today and we hope that we can contribute in various ways uh, to the development of the Bangladesh chapter through which not only Bangladesh will benefit, but the whole world will be enriched through that. What a privilege. Vidan Bhai, you're welcome. Please join the collaborative. We'll make sure that you have your membership sent out. Tafik Bhai, can I ask you to unmute yourself and speak? Yeah. Um, thank you so much. First of all, um, I'm actually sorry for uh, being um, joining late. Uh, it, it, this actually overlapped with another meeting I had. Uh, I'm actually joining from uh, Singapore, and um, I had an opportunity to uh, meet uh, the Access Health International colleagues um, in Singapore as part of uh, my um, collaborative journey um, uh, with different organizations here, uh, especially um, as the uh, regional um, uh, representative for the Western Pacific region for health systems global. So I'm uh, particularly glad uh, to see Access Health International developing this collaborative effort with um, BRAC, James B. Grant School of Public Health, which is actually my alma mater. And I, I worked there for the longest period of my career there. So I'm, I really want to congratulate um, uh, Access Health International and also the BRAC School of Public Health. Just wanted to add uh, one reflection on the framework that um, I had the opportunity to um, to uh, listen to towards the end of um, Professor Mala Miridha's uh, presentation. And he uh, mentioned uh, four um, different um, dimensions of this framework, uh, which are quite um, interesting and excellent. But uh, while looking at different frameworks that are floating around in uh, pandemic preparedness and uh, resilience, etc., one um, issue that I noticed is that most of these frameworks are actually meant for um, assessing uh, the national level uh, preparedness. So I'm just wondering, I mean, I was just looking at these, uh, the, the, the different indicators that Professor Molo Imridha um, showed. So I think it's, it's, it's actually, I mean, these, uh, these indicators are well suited to apply at the sub-national and regional or local level as well. So I'm just wondering if this has been um, tried um, and if not um, perhaps this could be something um, to be explored uh, for the future thank you yeah in fact the the tool uh, has the elements at multiple levels the whole intent was what is at a local level what is at a district level what is at a state level uh, so some of the indicators are much more relevant at a detailed tool, actually, maybe uh, we will share once it is put into validation for further suggestions because it is a kind of a, a as a part of collaborative learning, the tool itself will undergo repeated validations and improvements so that it is practical, easily applicable in a given system, and uh, highly resourceful for uh, actually taking some actions. Thank you. Um, any more hands that need to go up? Uh, Satish Bhai, up. Yeah, yes, I think. Thank you so much and uh, greetings from uh, Dr. Satish Kumar from Delhi. I am professor at uh, International Health Management Research Institute. It has been an excellent presentation. So all the presentations were so enriching. And I congratulate you know, Health for this uh, wonderful initiative to create a learning, you know, culture amongst different organizations, both in public sector as well as in 
in uh, private sector. My two concerns, you know, one is that there got to be some effort to establish a stronger linkages between those who produce knowledge, that in the academic community, and those who are expected to use the knowledge. That is the directorate or the service implementation community. I mean, and and there are mechanisms available, but then institution those mechanisms have not been institutionalized. And maybe we need to, you know, collectively uh, say uh, make moves to have more established strong links. That's that's one thing. My second concern is that there's no accountability mechanism. Uh, I mean, those who are producing knowledge, evidence-based knowledge, got to be used for policy intervention. But then those who are producing knowledge and those responsible for you know, intervening or imp implementation, uh, I mean, nobody can hold them accountable if they are not using it. So the cost of inaction, especially if it is a case of you know, disaster, is much more. That's my second uh, concern, how to establish an accountability mechanism. And my last question is, you know, related to Professor uh, uh, Malay Kanti's presentation, very good presentation, the four domains of indicators. I was just thinking that the local community is the first responder as well as the victim of disaster. Now, I, I, I don't see, you know, indicators, you know, clearly focused towards that segment. Most of the domains, they were supply oriented domains, whether it's the leadership governance or the medical supplies or the financial production or you know the healthcare progeny, very important. But then the community itself must also be an active partner in uh, uh, with, with regard to the uh, say indicated domain. So those are my four or five concerns. Otherwise, this is a very enriching you know, session. Thanks. To the sufficient factor are the, the people and health in the center of the health system. And that is one of the key thematic area and indicators are evolving into the community level resilience and their participatory governance and how they influence right. the health systems. Too. So yeah, your point is well valid and it's uh, fortunately incorporated as a part of uh, the central domain of these four functions. Thank you. Um, all good things must come to an end. And before I do that, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of Dr. Yeldandi, colleagues from WHO Geneva, Professor Mala Rao, Aida, Shalini Bharatji, Dr. Elvin Marcelo, Professor Murthy, Eloise, Mary Ventured from UNICEF, who have actually Gotham Sen, who have actually stood by us through this entire journey and who are always there to encourage us on each of these calls and who come back to us to tell us what we do next and how we do next. And then to sum up a very difficult conversation of the afternoon, to follow all the people who actually spoke and spoke their heart and their minds. Seven million pandemic deaths and how can we look at resilience? The collaborative learning journey that is a global priority today because we need to understand the steady state and also how we can react to and respond to resilience. The objective of the global learning collaborative being self-learning, self-governing and self-sustaining. So time, expertise and knowledge that you all bring to this collaborative today is something that we actually cherish, deeply respect, and expect that you will continue to support us in this journey as we go forward. We have both geographic and thematic areas that we learn from and we'll grow from. So the geographies are expanding and the learning is like the river that Dr. Reddy always alludes to. The balance sheet report approach that Dr. Rahman gave us and how he actually could bring in four slides, 50 years of work and how the global problems and the individual problems were both addressed. From being a victim to a manager, 
fertility decline strategy, food difficulty from 70 to 170 million, the citizens proactive forums, the grassroots approach which met the government's approach with Brock and Garmin, the solutions centric approach that they took for innovation didn't come from nowhere. Reality, the ground focus that they never deterred from. Policy entrepreneurship, a new term in my vocabulary, Dr. Rahman, and I'm not going to let this one go. Pluralistic healthcare and how it actually did find its way and the challenges that they face even in spite of that. The big deaths post the event and the evaluation of those that actually brought out newer innovations. Jurisdiction ambiguity in health system strengthening that most countries face, but don't acknowledge the way they need to. Engaging in active advocacy. And we see a lot of that with the Bangladesh Health Watch and how they have actually taken on eight far-reaching remote locations to make local and global both happen. The audience that gave us the thought process of aging population, preparation of the youth that needs to come in, stronger linkages that we need to have towards directives accountability and the rise for knowledge that goes along with it? And how do we look at first responders, the citizens as the last mile? I can't sum it up because I would take as much time to sum it up as has been spent in the last 90 minutes or more. But there are two messages that will stay with us forever. The journey is greater than the impact. Don't forget, we learn as we go. And learning to action and action to learning will continue. Indeed, a privilege this evening, afternoon and night for all those people who have joined us for this momentous occasion, the Bangladesh chapter of the Global Learning Collaboratives. Thank you, everybody. Shabakhair. Good night.